we did all of their like you know her having her legs up on the desk and all of that stuff that's all Megan just saying I was like how do you sit do you I don't never sat in an office I sat in, I had a job in an office when I was 18 for six months but I've never sat in an office since you know how do you sit and what are you doing what's all your stuff on your desk and she sort of talked us through and she said most of the time she's got legs for days she has her legs up on the desk and um, Jodie would never, and you know, the opposites in them were so interesting. Um, and the stuff that they, that, you know, she eats like, like really, you know, she eats sort of junk, more junk stuff and Jodie doesn't and um, all of that stuff sort of filled all of those moments for us. Hi. <laughs> I am uh, Angelique Jackson, senior entertainment writer at Variety, and thank you so much for joining us for this special screening of She Said, one of AFI's top 10 films of the year. And joining me for this conversation is two-time Academy Award winner, Carrie Mulligan. <laughs> you know what's hilarious is before I... <laughs> You just said winner. I did. You just said winner. Well, in my I mind, won any I'm going to say she's a winner. I, <laughs> in my mum's dreams. I your mum and yeah. your mum and me. Yeah, uh, okay. I really. I'll take it. <laughs> before I came out here, I said you're probably going to say winner, aren't you? We're just. They gonna... wrote that actually in my parents' local newspaper. They said that I was coming to a screening of She Said uh, at their local cinema, which I wasn't, um, and that I had won for Promising Young Woman, which I didn't. Um, <laughs> so uh, my dad's going to frame it, I think. I appreciate that. Well, we are so thrilled to have you here to discuss this film. Um, truly, in playing Megan Toohey, and, 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 and I guess paying tribute to these women not only Megan and Jody, but also the women who came forward about their experiences. What has uh, being a part of She Said been like for you? Yeah, I think that's been the sort of biggest takeaway for all of us, for Zoe and I. Um, I don't think we could think about it too much in the making of it. I think the, the responsibility felt so huge. I think if we had thought every day about the, you know, it was obviously kind of heavy. The whole thing was really heavy. And I think if we had thought um, as much in the moment about who these people were. I think, it, yeah, it, the, the biggest honor of the whole thing has been that the survivors that participated in the film have come to the screenings. We've got to see audiences respond to them and that's just a privilege. Absolutely. You know, to, to g I had the opportunity to see the film um, and, and, and see these survivors alongside you all. Um, uh, and it, it, it feels special. You know, it feels like something that, that we haven't really seen before. You know, I, I think a lot of people, um, the idea of kind of Hollywood making a movie, investigating Hollywood, maybe got like a little squirrely. You know, how, how will they do it? How will they pull it off? But the movie is really more about these women, these journalists, and the, their really dogged pursuit of the truth. As you sat down with Megan uh, to kind of research this role, you kind of turned into a bit of an investigative reporter, I understand, asking her questions about her life. What was something that was really important to you as you kind of set out to figure out, you know, how they did this? I think, yeah, I think we were just talking backstage about the, I mean, I don't think you can overstate the courage of the women who came forward. And I think it's particularly I mean, you see Ashley and Laura and Zelda and it's, you know, incredible. But um, I think the part of the film that always really sticks out to me is when Ambra, you hear the tape with Ambra um, and Weinstein and she's wearing a wire and having this conversation with him. And you just, I just can't, it, it's unbelievable courage that she did that. Um, so there was so much about that that I don't think I could ever wrap my head around how they were capable of that kind of bravery. But um, with Megan, I was just... First of all, I always think it's interesting when you get offered a part where you think, I could never be. Like, no one would ever genuinely think I was a journalist. <laughs> you know, or an event, like a serious journalist. Like, it's so ridiculous. Like, I played a police officer a couple of years ago, and it took me months to convince myself I could be a policeman because it was just so silly. And I was pregnant, so it was just... Um, I really had to fight my own. But with Megan, I thought, gosh, how do you do that? How do you... With these very serious things that they investigate, how do you... And with this in particular... You're ringing someone up in the middle of the day. You don't know what their life is like at home. And you're saying, I know this horrendous thing happened to you in your life. You may not have told anyone about it, but I'd like you to tell me. And then I'd like to tell the whole world. And just the idea of 
somebody whose psychology can sit with that, I found so fascinating. Because I know for me, I'd be so... I'd be so concerned with the ramifications. I'd be up at night thinking, well, what if that person now is triggered and then they go into a hole and then I've caused that and all this stuff. And, and I, I really wanted to understand how, because I know Megan to be incredibly compassionate and empathetic. And the reason that she's able to do it, and the reason Jodie's able to do it is because they have a real conviction in the truth and that ultimately the truth can will serve all of us. you know. And that's their, so it's a vocation for them. They feel kind of called to do this. and. Their, their vocation is to unearth mistruths and put them out and then allow society to decide what to do with it. So once I'd spent time with her and that sort of became clear, I sort of got it a bit more. Not that I could ever do it, but it, it made sense to me. Something that is so striking about Megan as a reporter is that she is so good at just letting a question linger. She will let you fill in the silence. Yeah. And and how, you know, as you were trying to figure out that that pacing and that, um, you know, what, what was kind of key for that for you? When did you notice that when you were talking to her? Has anybody seen that interview with Prince Andrew and Emily Maitlis on Newsnight? Did anyone see that? Yeah, you will have seen it. So Emily Maitlis is like our scariest, most brilliant journalist. Um, and if you go on Newsnight, you're fucked. Like it's, if you're a politician, you go on Newsnight, it's like just you're asking for trouble because they're so, um, you know, they're brilliant. They're, it's the best thing you can, do, you know, it's the best, most prestigious show. And Prince Andrew decided to, of his own volition to give an interview to Newsnight. And Emily Maitlis, <laughs> just watch it. It's just, I mean, it's just... This is the interview in which he started talking about how he doesn't have any sweat glands after being, and how he wasn't there on the night he was in Pizza Express. And like, he just volunteered this stuff, and she just sat there. And I studied that <laughs> um, interview, and I know Emily a bit, and I discussed it with her, and then I talked with, you know, and also just getting to talk to Megan about the best part of the resource of playing someone in real life, as you can say, when you were in that moment with Lanny Davis in that scene. And she described it like a game of chess. and. So we played it like a game of chess, and um, it's just fun to have all those details. Absolutely, it's so brilliant how she's like, oh, oh, Megan, oh, Lanny. <laughs> like, they just, they really go back and forth, and, and of course she also had to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Donald Trump, toe-to-toe -to -toe with Harvey Weinstein in those scenes, um, but on the other side of, of her reporting coin was Jody, and on the other side for you was Zoe. Um, what was it like getting an opportunity to work with someone that you know so well? You, know, you all have, have been friends since, what, 2008? Um. <laughs> yeah, so Zoe and I met, we did a production of The Seagull um, in New York in 2008, and I played Nina and she played Masha, and we shared this tiny dressing room, and um, we became best friends she was a bridesmaid at my wedding we, you know we've sort of grown up together and um and then we'd always tried to find something to do together and we couldn't find the thing and then um Paul Dano directed Wildlife which she co-wrote and they sort of produced together and I was in that so that was sort of the closest we'd gotten um and then just completely randomly we both got cast in this and um, it was just, we couldn't, we just kept on pinching. We couldn't believe our luck that we had not just got to be in the same film, but got to be partners in a film. I mean, that really is the kismet part, that it wasn't like, oh, okay, I got cast and I'm recommending my, my friend would think would be great for this. It was, you know, the producers went out to her totally separately. Yeah, 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 and she kept on saying, oh, you've put me up for this. And I said, I really didn't, but I did, but I remember my husband read it um, and I had it on one of those, you know, this link will explode your computer if you know because that kind of thing and I said you gotta read it in 12 hours or something and he read it and he went so good and you should do it and Zoe should play Jodie and I said I know but it's not really my like thing I can't you know push my mates um so and then a week later they were meeting well, when you read it, what made you say, yes, I would, I would love to play Megan, even though I, I can't really even imagine myself as a journalist, I, I really want to do this part? I think that, because I couldn't really, because I was sort of thought it was a hard sell for myself. Um, again, the idea of kind of wrapping my head around the way her brain works was interesting. Um, and then also the sort of, I, I, once I read the book and I kind of, and I really, I, I didn't think about who had written the article. When the story came out, you know, obviously the ramifications were huge and the world changed to a degree. Um, but I never had given thought about the women who'd written it. And it felt similar to Suffragette in a way. It was, you know, at some point there has to be a film about this. They, these women, these survivors and Jodie and Megan, they did something that 
fundamentally altered the course of history and that's worthy of a film. And it really is a, a rare moment where we get a chance to see these two women journalists, this pair, um, really working together and also seeing their lives. You know, this is an opportunity to see their families and their children and how they operate and, and the different ways that um, being a woman in the newsroom can be different. You know, for example, when they're trying to decide who's going uh, overseas to in invest or to interview all of these sources, uh, it's a question of, okay, I have to talk to my husband versus in a lot of movies that we see about men, it's like, okay, I'm just like yeah. on the plane. Uh, so what was it like getting an opportunity to, to really showcase uh, the realities for a woman in this position? Yeah, I think, I don't know, we, we, I thought it was a really full picture of working motherhood. I think I often try and explain to my, I mean, my job is so, it seems so trivial in, in comparison, but I'm always trying to say to them, you know, I do like my job because I always have to feel like I have to, I feel terrible when I go and, you know, but that I have to also say, but I actually do like it, you know, I'm not, so that's a sort of tough balance. And I, and I really, the first thing and the thing that kind of hooked me into the script was her experience of postnatal depression because I'd had a very similar experience with my first and, um, and it was also work that kind of got me out of it in a way. So we, Megan and I, I think that was like the first thing we ever talked about. It's one of those interesting things because I've, I've spoken with Megan and she said that that was one of the moments when she was watching the film that she really uh, felt like you, you nailed it. That moment when you're walking back into the New York Times office and there's just this kind of like over, not overwhelming, but this this look of relief almost. She's like, okay, I'm, I'm getting back into me. But that doesn't mean that I you know don't love my daughter. That doesn't mean I don't want to be at home. Um, but that's also such a rare thing to see. You know, I feel like more often it's a situation of like, uh, you know, you're supposed to, it's horrible to have to, you know, go back to work and leave your child, but it's a beautiful thing as well. Um, yeah, what, what was it like uh, portraying uh, that, 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 that experience of going back to work? I think less and less, and less we're seeing really binary um, kind of portrayals of women on screen. And I think that's an example of kind of the complexity of the experience that I'm, you know, and there's so many films this year that have got that, uh, you know, have got so much more nuance in, but yeah, historically we've seen, you know, one or the other, you're either like a terrible mother and delighted to leave your kids or you're, you know, I think it's, I liked that that, it really was suffragette was the thing. I was very, very depressed and suffragette, the suffragette tour was coming up and I was, my baby was like three and a half weeks old. And it was either cancel the whole thing or just jump on. And I jumped on and I got completely embraced by all the women in that film. And and then actually, even though that was just a press tour, you know, it seems so silly by comparison, but it was, it was, it sort of hooked me out somehow and helped. And, and I still, my baby came everywhere and it was great, but slowly I got kind of stronger. It's, none of this is trivial. It is, it is, you know, it is, it is us pursuing the thing that we love. And I think that's the beauty of this that's the beauty of what we see here in this film and what we see so often in your work. Um, I, I do want to get into some of the questions from our audience here. Um, the first one comes from George, who asked, did doing this film change your views on journalism or the subject, et cetera? I think it probably, did. I don't think I'd given, I think maybe sort of as an actor, I've had kind of a defensive position with the press maybe <laughs> um, or you know I think maybe you're sort of we, we've become a bit kind of afraid of or in our job probably of sort of I don't know you just don't want to say anything stupid and get in trouble um, but there's I think there has been probably I haven't sort of I think it, it, there's it's a it's a totally different beast isn't it investigative journalism is a different beast so I think it's more that I just didn't have an understanding of what it even entailed and I didn't understand the lengths which you have to go to to be able to say something I think Zoe and I both had a sort of somewhat naive belief that if you knew something to be true you could therefore write it and and it's just not the case and it's um, you, I think what the film does so well is illustrate exactly how much you need to be able to dot your T's and dot your I's, <laughs> cross, your <laughs> cross your T's to be able to, you know, um, put something on the record. And um, so I think that was a real eye opener. And again, the, the, we were just saying backstage, like the, the, the courage, the courage, the courage, the women who did this, it's just extraordinary. I cannot imagine what it took for them to do it, whether they went on the record or not. And I think 
hopefully the film just gives people waves of reminders that somehow got lost in all of this, I think. And like, what incredibly strong women, you know, it's just a film full of female heroes. And, and I think outside of a kind of, you know, comic book universe, your female heroism on screen is not that common. I mean, as a journalist, I, I remember watching this for the first time and I, I'm pretty sure I shed more than a couple of tears, especially by the end, because that moment of pressing publish is is in, in some cases weeks, months of work and you just hope, but you have no idea what's going to happen at that point. And I, I know that in, in, in talking to Megan, you also, um, in addition to finding out how she interviewed, really, you know, got to know how she worked with sources. And uh, I believe you've found some, like, you know, notes that she wrote once. Yeah, I went to her office and she had a pile and it was just a pile of, like, receipts, um, envelopes and, you know, various. And that was what she would just, because she'd never, someone would call her and she'd be holding her kid or she'd be making supper or she'd be kind of getting ready for work. And that was the moment where the source wanted to talk. So she'd grab like the nearest thing and scribble. <laughs> so she had this enormous stack of just cr like crap pieces of paper that she had to sort of, um, but yeah, it's it, it was fascinating. It was so fascinating. And also the way that her mind works, because she obviously is, most of the thing, thing, things that Megan covers are not fun subjects. And um, she gave me a playlist of her music. Um, and it's all like incredibly upbeat, like really like reggae and <laughs> it's so fun. Um, and I think she, you know, she doesn't watch any serious films or TV. She watches, you know, I said, what, we were both nervous about the film coming out. And I was like, I'm just going to sleep watching 30 Rock every night. She was like, so am I, because that's how she processes the end of the day. She doesn't, you know, go home and watch serious stuff because it's just too, her life, her work is so serious and so dark in times. Um, that actually leads very well into our next question from Kate Faraway, um, asking, considering the subject matter of this film, did making this film feel dangerous? Uh, can you speak to that? I think the danger for us felt it was in the, any risk of not serving the survivors in the way that they deserve to be. I think that was the only thing that felt risky. Um, and I feel like we walked into it confident about that because Dee Dee Gardner, the first conversation I ever had with Dee Dee, our producer, was about the survivors' involvement, about Ashley being a part of the film, that, that Rebecca Lenkovitz, our screenwriter, had been consulting with Zelda and with Laura and Rowena. So it felt like they were so, and survivors had been cast in the film, so it felt like they were so integral to the film being made, it wouldn't have been made without them. So I think we just felt that that was the most, that was the highest priority. Um, and then secondary to that, obviously Megan and Jodie being happy with their portrayals, which would have been a bummer if they were upset, but wouldn't have been quite as, you know, that they really were the, uh, the, the survivors with the heart of the film. And um, so that's what we were mindful of every day. Uh, to the danger element, I did want to ask you about one of the scenes, um, because obviously this was another part that it really showed the reality of, of journalism in general, but especially for women, the phone call that she gets, that Megan gets after um, reporting out the Trump story, where the caller, the anonymous caller says they're going to you know, what they're going to do to her uh, afterwards. You know, what was it like to also, you know, put put things like that out there, that, that those are the type of things that sometimes happen to these investigative reporters? Yeah, I think that was their experience. I think they did feel, I don't think that they said they never felt in physical danger, but I think psychologically just to know that there were various elements working against them very hard. Um, the whole way through. I think also the amazing thing about Megan is that, you know, she did that reporting on Trump and I think in her mind, you know, he still became president. So I think the, the idea that they would then go on to another case that was sort of, in, I think her expectations were so low because nothing had, you know, that that huge investigation had not really led to significant change in her mind. She, she wasn't sure if, you know, what she was doing mattered. And we fortunately saw that it does, and it did. Um, this next question comes from Krista, asking, how do you begin your process for each character? Is it always the same? Do you begin with physical aspects? Um, no, it's usually, I don't know. What do I, uh, <laughs> read it. Um, no, I... I think I've changed since I've had kids because I've had to sort of, I used to be very kind of, 
I used to just sort of luxuriate in time and now I have no time. Um, so no, I actually, I work with a woman in LA on Zoom called Kim Gillingham, who's amazing. Um, and she helps me think through things. Um, but generally, yeah, I, I sort of, I mean, with this, I get a real person, which is sort of the best resource of all time. Um, but a script is, I mean, I think sort of really kind of knuckling down on the script early on and feeling um, the kind of forensic about that. And then I do loads of sort of like airy fairy like poetry and I mean, not writing poetry, you know, I like find poems that connect to everything and songs that connect to everything. I usually have a theme for, you know, one, like different parts of the script and that kind of stuff. So it's sort of a little kind of multimedia <laughs> experience in my head by the time I get to set. Um, but it does vary. And then sometimes it's like, you know, that's the, the opposite is true. And you just sort of show up and wing it. And um, that's not usually the best. But it, yeah, you, I mean, I've, uh, it depends how much time you have. And the majority of things I've done are very low budget and you just show up and, you know, and, and if you trust people, you've got a great director. We had a great director. I've been so lucky with directors. So it, it's so, it's not a solo experience for me at all. In this case, obviously, Megan had given you uh, the playlist. Was there anything that was already, you know, a song or anything you were already kind of thinking of before she handed it over? There wasn't, but there's one on there. Um, I'm going to butcher it. How does it, what's the, it goes, welcome to our house. It's like Flo Rider or yes, something. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it's so, so hilarious. Um, my children love because her playlist will sometimes just randomly come on my phone and the kids always love that. Um but yeah, that one, it's really joyful. The whole is like Chance the Rapper's on there. And um, it's, yeah, I, I thought it said so much about her as well. Um, it was so helpful to have that sort of, there's hardly anything on there that's not sort of an upper, you know. Um, Alina Harmon has a, a very similar question um, about your favorite parts of the process when creating a character. At what point does everything click for you? From like week six or something. <laughs> um, it's really annoying. In theatre, it is genuine. It's like week six. And then if you're in an eight-week run or something, it's sort of devastating. But um, uh, on this, we had a rough start. Not rough. We, we started in the New York Times. and We did everything in the New York Times in the first two weeks. So it felt a little bit like a trial by fire because we were in the actual New York Times and it was suddenly very kind of overwhelming. Um, but I think a couple of days into this, it started feeling, I think the first couple of days always feels really creaky to me. Um, but this one was, once we had a news, we had a scene with Frank Wood, Andre Brower, Patricia, there was like a group sort of newsroom scene, then it sort of clicked in, day four or something. And you just were sort of like, okay, I might be a journalist after all. Was it, you know, I guess you weren't carrying your coffee, but also that felt very, it felt very journalism me to me. We we did we did all of their like you know her having her legs up on the desk and all of that stuff that's all Megan just saying I was like how do you sit do you I don't never sat in an office I sat in, I had a job in an office when I was eighteen for six months but I've never sat in an office since you know how do you sit and what do you do what's all your stuff on your desk and she sort of talked us through and she said most of the time she's got legs for days she has her legs up on the desk and um, Jodie would never and you know the opposites and then were so interesting. Um, and the stuff that they, that, you know, she eats like, like really, you know, she eats sort of junk, more junk stuff and Jodie doesn't and um, all of that stuff sort of filled all of those moments for us. Absolutely. Um, this question comes from Jacqueline uh, asking uh, about the preparation for this role being researched with the women who had experienced this firsthand. How did that empower you? And were you in any way connected to any of the women that went through this trauma, friends, et cetera? Um, and she added, thank you and happy Christmas. Oh, happy Christmas. Uh, I wasn't connected to anyone. I mean, I think you'd be hard pushed to find a woman who hasn't had some experience um, of some degree or has a friend who has been through something like this. So it didn't feel like an industry thing to us at all. Um, but no, I wasn't sort of... Um, connected to any of the women who participated. Again, I think it was just, uh, it's just enormously sensitive. I felt the same way about Promising Young Woman, even though it was fictional. I still felt, well, this is something that touches so many people um, more than you can ever know. You don't know what people are walking into the cinema with or what, you know. So I think we were just always hyper aware of the sensitivity around it. And you just want to 
pay special cares, you know, to care to that sort of stuff. Um, Danielle and Maria asked, um, how do you approach a role when you're playing a real person, especially concerning something so timely and so weighted, especially as a woman in this industry? So a, a similar question. Yeah, I, I mean, I think one of the biggest hurdles was sort of feeling like Megan wanted me to do it. Because <laughs> um, I think you sort of have the, you know, if someone's going to make a film about you, you probably have a little list in your mind of who you want that person to be. And I, you know, there's no way to know who was on hers. Um, so I think the initial thing is like feeling that comfort. And then they were just incredibly generous with us. They couldn't have been more open about their lives, about their personal lives, their professional lives. Um, and they want the story to be told. And I think they said, you know, they started writing the book, which this is based on, within months of the investigation being printed. So they had no idea what was coming or what was happening or what the results of any of the trials would be. They were just, they just said, we really want to document this, what we know to be fact, because we think it's going to be important that there are fact-based, you know, documents about this investigation. So they wrote it all down. And I think they were just delighted that it would have another life, you know, and again, portraying things, I mean, hardly anything in the film didn't happen, so um, I think they just wanted it to be sort of on the record, so to speak, and I, yeah, just didn't want to sort of, and I think Zoe and I also realised early on with real survivors in the film, with Ashley in the film, any attempt for us to sort of act or be sort of, you know, sort of flourishy or try and sort of mimic their pattern of speech or their mannerisms or whatever it would just fall flat and distract from the story so we abandoned within the first conversation any notion of kind of trying to be them it was just how do we capture a bit of who they are it, it, I will say it does give me great joy to imagine the bar scene actually happening in real life because I think every woman here wishes we would have done that once so much fun. Um, I loved it. I really hurt my hand because I, I hit, we did it so many times and I kept smacking my hand down and thing and then, but it was wonderful. Yeah. And he was, he was so great because that part could have so easily been, you know, he just played it so well. It was so, because he's ultimately sort of pretty inoffensive to begin with. He's not really, I've seen worse, you know, but, but, and so he delivered it in a kind of friendly, kind of soft way. And I, I thought that was such a good choice because I think the opposite would have been very easy. The scene, you know, it had texture because actually she's massively overreacting and what she's reacting to is nothing to do with him, really. It's the culmination of everything that's going on and, and this is sort of the, but um, he, he played it brilliantly. It is, it is the one time where she can really, you know, in all these interviews as she has to be very measured yeah. in her responses to some atrocious things people are saying to her. Sorry, dude, at bar, you, you got the brunt of it. <laughs> Another question uh, we have here. Uh, does your process as an actor change when you are also producing the piece? And is producing something that you have always seen yourself doing? Or was that just a discovery in your journey? What did I produce? <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Did you... Did you it was like, because you didn't produce Promising Young Woman at all. I didn't produce nope. Rose. Okay, so I think it was I was producing. Producer, I think I produced on Mudbound. Yes. Yeah, but not really. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know. Uh, no, I, I, I've, you know, I... I find if I kind of know too much, I get a bit kind of... I sort of, I, I want to sort of open up a lovely parcel and, and go, ooh, who's this? And then do it. And if I think about it for longer than about five weeks, I don't want to do it anymore. So I think producing things that I'm in have has never been that much of a sort of, and it maybe uh, maybe that will change, but f uh, yeah, in, in sort of so far, it's always been kind of more exciting just to come in and just be a sort of jobbing actor and leave and not think about it and not get involved and see anything and do anything. <laughs> Technically, I'm going to say you were a producer on a music video that Steven Spielberg directed. I was a producer on that, yeah. I was also costume and sound <laughs> and snacks. It's a great first, I've got to say. Um, well, our final question comes from Christine, who has asked, uh, what was the defining moment in your career that made you feel like you made it? Or are you still awaiting that moment? And she said, heart you. Oh. <laughs> um... 
May, yeah, when I did The Seagull, when I was 21 and I was on Broadway with Zoe and I, there's a scene in act two where Nina and Tregorin talk and he's sort of, you know, fascinating and she's sort of, I mean, blown away by him and he leaves and she walks out and she looks out across the lake and she says, I'm dreaming. And I was in the Walter Kerr Theatre um, and I had seen Kevin Bacon do a one-man show there when I was in my, when I was 14 or something. And I was suddenly like, oh my gosh, I'm standing on that stage um, saying this line. And it was and in London, whenever I'd said I'm dreaming, I'd always been like, oh, this line's such a nightmare. Because you're on your own on stage and you kind of, you know, and she's so... Um, and then when I got to New York, it was the first time that I like said it and was it felt kind of, yeah, so then really. It's a beautiful moment. Listen, we love anything that can come full circle and truly appreciate you taking the time to dive into this role and so many of them. Congratulations on another just stunner. And uh, as, as Emerald Fennell once described you as, uh, so unfailingly truthful and about as grounded as an actress gets, I am so grateful to share this stage with you, Carrie Mulligan. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone.